pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael S. Oaken, who is an internationally recognized clinical investigator, author, and contributor to the understanding of diagnosis, treatment, and management of Parkinson's disease and related movement disorders. Dr. Oaken is an Adelaide Blackner professor and chairman of the Department of Neurology and executive director of the Norman Fixell Institute for Neurological Diseases, College of Medicine, University of Florida. Author and UF professor Michael Oaken will lecture on his two new books published in 2020, Ending Parkinson's Disease and Living with Parkinson's Disease. He is also uh, offered to contribute uh, some copies of that book uh, to our Okamak Library. He will discuss and discusses a prescription for action in Parkinson's disease. Dr. Oaken, welcome. Thanks, Ed, and thank you for the invitation to speak. I, I have spoken to this group uh, before, and it's always a, a pleasure, and I'm always happy to, to come back. And so thank you for, for having me. Um, I see a lot of uh, old friends, you know, as I you know, flip through the uh, attendees, and I see Paul Robel, I see Ken Burns, I see a lot of my old pals, and so good to, um, to see you all. Um, and certainly if you have follow-up questions, you know, feel free to email me or call me or I'm pretty easy to get uh, a hold of. You can even Google on the UF website and I'll give you my contact information uh, as well. So um, I thought that we'd spend uh, at least a few minutes, you know, talking about a, a couple of topics in uh, the area of Parkinson's disease. It's an area that um, I've spent uh, a, a good bit of my career on and one that I think is really uh, important. And just um, a week or two ago, um, we had an op-ed in the Daily Beast uh, about this idea of, you know, what if we sped up, you know, what if we actually sped the efforts up for Parkinson's disease? Like, what could that look like? And can we learn something from the, um, the speed with which uh, we moved the vaccinations for COVID-19, you know, from a, you know, a conception, you know, a first case was back in, you know, December of last year and within a year to vaccination in humans and, um, and really one of the great medical marvels. And I'm going to try to convince you today that when we think about a disease like Parkinson's, maybe the, the burn isn't as, you know, pressing in the news cycle, but I'm going to try to convince you that, uh, that it is something that we do need to speed up on. And, um, and I'll, I'll do my best to, to make those arguments based on several of the, of the recent uh, books that we have uh, co-authored and put into the, into the public domain. So I'm going to share my screen and see if, uh, if we can make this happen. So let's see if this works. Do you see the slides or do you see the slide presenter? I see, see pre presenter view. You see presenter view. Okay. Let's see if I can figure out how to stop that. Let's try again. Great. Let's do this one more time. Screen share. How about now? Still presenter view or regular view? It's presenter view. It's as it's you can not see in presenter view. Well, I was seeing the slides both times. There we go. How about now? You got them now? Yes. The regular full slides? Yes. Okay. Perfect. I'm not uh, super smart, so. You have to you have to forgive me here. Okay. Yeah, it's Zoom learning, and then when you have too many monitors, uh, it gets sometimes gets a little overwhelming. 
So we're going to talk a little bit about living with Parkinson disease and ending Parkinson disease. And we'll have plenty of time for questions. And so um, it should be you know, a fun morning. And again, thanks to Ed and everyone for having me. Um, I have no industry conflicts of interest. I've been supported by multiple organizations. I serve as the medical director of the Parkinson's Foundation since 2006, and we have 47 centers of excellence all over the world. And my funding comes mostly through the National Institutes of Health and uh, multiple foundations. But since I don't belong to any industry sources, I'm happy to answer your questions directly. These are my federal funding sources. Um, if you get a chance, we actually are right next door to you. This is the new Norman Fixell uh, Institute for Neurological Diseases at the University of Florida Health. Um, it was rumored when it was built that there would be a pathway between um, OCAMIC and this institute. Um, I, I can neither confirm nor deny whether that was ever talked about, but uh, certainly we don't own all the property in between. But Maybe at some point we will, or we could negotiate a path that would be pretty, pretty cool. We do have a nature path that goes around the building, and one of the um, Okamic residents actually has a, a horticulture garden out uh, that, um, that he keeps out for the group. It's all under one roof, and there's an article in JAMA Neurology about this concept called the Service and Science Hub concept, where we put clinical research. Um, every patient's a clinical patient and research patient and all the rehab and everything all under one roof. So it's a beautiful facility and certainly you're welcome to come tour it. And of course, down the street, we have the new neuromedicine hospital uh, that's also pictured here in the lower left. And so we're always happy to, to have you come. And for those of you that are interested, we have all sorts of chats with the Parkinson Foundation on Twitter. So there's a Twitter handle. And we have a blog called Parkinson'sSecrets.com that we interview experts on every week. So we're going to talk about the Parkinson's pandemic, and I'm going to frame the discussion around two uh, recent books that we published. Um, the first came out in uh, March of 2020. That's just as the pandemic was heating up. It's called Ending Parkinson's Disease, A Prescription for Action. And one of the interesting things I'll tell you about the book is it was done by Hachette Publishing Company uh, in New York, and the publishing company actually changed the title. I'm not super fond of the title, Ending Parkinson's Disease, and in fact, I would call it Parkinson's Disease Is, as Bastian Bloom, one of our co-authors, uh, suggested. But the original title for the book was actually The Parkinson's Pandemic, and that was changed, but if you sort of uh, have any sense of what's happened historically, if we had kept that title, we probably would have sold a few more copies uh, of the book. Um, we also have another book with a couple of uh, folks, some of you may even know them because they're physician scientists at the University of Florida, Irene Malati and Wissam Deeb, who's uh, recently finished his American Brain Foundation grant and uh, moved to be the chief at UMass, UMass in, uh, up in Boston area. And so I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about both of these, and I'm going to try to contextualize some of the argument that we put out recently in the, in the Daily Beast about what if we sped up. We have done the impossible before. The suffering we experienced, it pushed us forward. It did not stop us. Stigma was there. Our brothers and sisters marched on the streets until it wasn't. The challenge inspired us. Together, we rose to the occasion. We fought back. And we will do it again. We will end Parkinson's. Our fight begins now. So that was the trailer for the book. We have done. And I think it's important to keep in context, you know, 
the reason that we're making the argument isn't because we're, you know, excited about, you know, writing a book, uh, you know, another book about something. It's because the problem is getting big and it's getting really big. And Parkinson's is now the fastest growing neurological disorder. It's actually growing faster than Alzheimer's disease, brain tumors, um, other maladies that you may know that affect the brain and the spinal cord. And that may surprise you, but um, myself and Boston Bloom, who's a co-author of the book, and Ray Dorsey, boss is in the Nijmegen in the Netherlands, and Ray is at the University of Rochester. We were scheduled to be in Lausanne, Switzerland, which is the headquarters of the World Health Organization. And we were scheduled to be there right in the middle of the pandemic in July. So we've actually corresponded with them yesterday um, because they are taking up Parkinson disease as, uh, as one of their diseases because of the growth. And they have uh, been part of the data monitoring that has really uncovered you know, how rapidly this is rising. And so one must ask the question, you know, why do we care? And it turns out that over a lifetime, one in 15 of us will get Parkinson's disease. And so if you grew up and you were in a classroom of 25 or 30 students, and you can think through, you know, those students that you went through grade school with, two of you, either you or somewhere else, someone else, or two people within that uh, cohort is going to end up with Parkinson. And that is an actually staggering number when you think about it in those terms. And we went back and did some projections and our, our projections were led by Ray Dorsey, um, who I mentioned is up in Rochester and Ray has led a, a number of, uh, of these works looking at economic impacts and, and just the impacts of, of growth and when he went back, he dug in and looked at 25 year epics or periods. And so if you look at the period between 1990 and 2015, you can see that Parkinson in the, mo the world's most populous countries and people who are above the age of 50, and we know people get Parkinson that are below the age of 50, it's gonna more than double from 2.6 million to 6.3 million. Now, if we do that same projection uh, out the next 25 years up to 2040, it again more than doubles, but the magnitude of 13 million people on the planet is tremendous. And in fact, if we think about this magnitude and we think about the healthcare systems and ask ourselves whether the healthcare systems either in the United States with Medicare or uh, across the world, even with different types of provision of care, whether we're prepared for the economic consequences of this and the suffering, we are not. And in fact, this could bankrupt and set back uh, a lot of our healthcare systems. And so this is probably the first argument that we should make about speeding up. Now, if you do even a cursory search, whether you're a scientist or not, you can look on Google, you can look at major medical journals, you can find these very simple uh, linear graphs looking at life expectancy. And this is the part of the talk where I tell you that the greatest medical advance, even the greatest advance, I would say, innovation of the last hundred years has been the doubling of the lifespan. So it's not the computer in my opinion, it's not the, the iPhone, it's the doubling of life expectancy. So if you look here at any of these many publications, they'll show you that in 1850, people were living at 40 or just a hair under 40. And you know, as we get into 1990 and turn the century again, we're climbing toward the 75, 80 life expectancies. And so, when we see growth like this, we certainly are worried as people live longer that they're gonna get more degenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and others. The body and the brain in particular were not designed to live as long as we're making them live. And so you have 
great researchers and great clinicians and a whole enterprise that is helping to expand the, the lifespan, which I think is great. People are living longer and living better. And so people have proposed that this increase in lifespan is what is driving that um, rapid rise in Parkinson disease. And although it's one factor and age is a major factor, when you control for all of the, uh, the factors in the growth, age is only one and does not account for all of the growth. And so we have to ask ourselves, what are the other factors? What are the other things that are driving this increase in degeneration in Parkinson? So let me back up and just say Parkinson's disease in general is a a condition where we see many myths, we see many misconceptions uh, about it uh, in, the, in the public. And one misconception is that it's all due to aging. We get old and we get Parkinson's. That's actually a myth, it's not true. It's not treatable is another myth. And actually one of the things it's often confused with is other diseases. And so people get the diagnosis and they associate it with something else and they think it's the end of the world. And in fact, um, clinicians around the world are doing a very poor job of delivering the diagnosis and letting people know that it is a treatable condition and folks can do well with Parkinson. And then finally, and maybe most pertinent to this talk is that there's nothing to be done about Parkinson's risk. So the risk that you'll later come up with Parkinson's. And if that were true, then we'd have to throw away multiple you know, medical journal articles and great scientists and their work that has now been published, maybe wasn't noticed 20 years ago, but have now been replicated over and over again. And we're seeing replication of these different studies. And so when we think about the term pandemic, and remember that I mentioned that the original title of the first book was the Parkinson's pandemic. We would all, I think, agree that this term is now reserved by the World Health Organization, um, practically speaking, for infectious causes, okay, of, uh, of disease. But if you think about the word in terms of its derivation, the word pan means all and the word demos means people. And most used in the 1850s and after, even before they understood infectious. So although Parkinson is probably non-infectious, it does exhibit many of the common characteristics of a pandemic. For example, pandemics extend over large geographical areas. You can check that box for Parkinson's. Pandemics tend to migrate and the burden appears to shift in response to changes in aging and industrialization. Check that box again for Parkinson. There's exponential growth. I think I showed you the figures and the figures have now drawn the attention of the World Health Organization. So check that box as well. And potentially no one is immune to the condition. So again, you've got a complete set. So although we don't use the term pandemic and people don't like applying the term pandemic, I think it's a, it's a useful dialogue to, to think of the rise in the numbers in this sense. So maybe we're not seeing it acutely as we talked about in the Daily Beast piece, but we are seeing this rise that unless we do something, unless we speed up, we're gonna have trouble. So what's the next step for Parkinson's? And when we did the research for the book, it became obvious to us, we looked at many different diseases and tried to understand what it takes to get out in front, what it takes to potentially end a disease or curb a disease or make a disease livable. And we noticed that there was a four piece, uh, there were four pieces to this puzzle and we called it the Parkinson Pact, okay? Each letter stands for something. So the P stands for prevent, the A stands for advocate, the C stands for care, and the T stands for the development of new treatments. 
This, folks, we believe is the formula when you look through other diseases, how they've done it. This is the formula that could lead to success. So let's talk about prevention of disease. And when we think about prevention, we're thinking about it in terms of, could we take folks that might be destined to get Parkinson and prevent them from getting the disease? This is a tall, tall order. And one of the areas that we're most interested in is the environment. And I mentioned to you that 20 years ago, we weren't so interested in this topic, okay? I'm just gonna be completely honest with you. We saw a paper here, a paper there. But as many of you who are great scientists like Ken Burns and others know, when you start to see science replicated and more and more groups coming up with the same results and the same risk factors that we call in science odds ratios, when those bets, it's like going to Las Vegas and making a bet, when those bets start to come in and very consistently are pointing in one direction, we start to worry that there are environmental causes and the environment may be pushing a lot of the disease. And so environment is probably the area that we're most likely to move into prevention the quickest. Exercise and behavioral therapies, interestingly, um, is now emerging. There are multiple studies. There was one in JAMA where they took a whole bunch of people who exercised and looked at Parkinson rates. And when they put all the thousands of people together, they saw that there was a benefit to exercising and whether or not you came down later with Parkinson. It's early days, but there's also studies of folks who already have gotten Parkinson. We have to draw the line because that's something different but slowing the progression, you know, impacting the disease progression from applying things like exercise or applying drugs or devices. And are there certain drugs or devices that if you took them, it may curb your later risk of getting Parkinson's. And so I'll give you an example. I'm sure many of you have watched a little more TV than uh, you maybe normally do during the pandemic. And you see all these commercials for arthritis drugs, and these are all TNF-alpha drugs, um, and that's tumor necrosis factor drugs. And there are now articles in JAMA and other places that are showing that exposure to some of these drugs in people with inflammatory bowel disease may curb the later occurrence of Parkinson. And so this is sort of a very important and interesting area. And remember with the PACT, the P stands for prevent. So we have to start thinking about preventing. And then once you have the disease, think about modifying it and slowing it down. So let's focus where we're starting to see the convergence of data, the evidence. And certainly pesticides is one of those areas. And now we believe that we should be banning specific pesticides and we should be banning specific chemicals because remember I told you when you go to Las Vegas and you take a bet, you're not going to take that bet unless the odds of you winning it are pretty good, right? And so now we start to see multiple papers in the literature showing us that the bet to exposure of certain pesticides and certain chemicals consistently is coming up high and very high for some of these things. Now, one that you may recognize because you might have it in your garage or might have seen it and it's very common is called Paraquat. Okay, and Paraquat is a pesticide and it has the strongest link to the later occurrence of Parkinson. It's been banned now in 32 countries, including China. But guess what, folks? In the US, not only has it not been banned, its use has doubled in the last 10 years. And recently, in the last year or two, the FDA had a chance to continue to move because there were, there were lots of advocacy trying to move in that direction. And they did not act, I'm sorry, the, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, not the FDA. So if we look at use of this chemical, Paraquat in the United States, what these gray bars tell you is how much we use in millions of pounds. So 6 million pounds of it was used in the United States in 1992, whereas 16 million were used in 2016. And so we've actually doubled our use, particularly as we've taken away the regulations 
and we become less regulated with the Environmental Protection Agency. And I don't want to shock anybody, but here's a heat map of Paraquat over the United States. It's not just in the, um, the, the belt of, of agriculture in, in the Midwest, but you can see it sort of all over and in certain spots that you would expect around Florida and also in California. So you have to ask yourself, where do you live? And it turns out that my house here in Gainesville, Florida is about 11.3 miles from a Superfund site. It's the Coppers site. And a Superfund site is a site where there's been a chemical spill or something into the environment, usually from an industrial source that the government has agreed to clean up. There are 23 such Superfund sites in uh, Silicon Valley. So where Google and all that great stuff you hear about on the news sits. And when you think about this, it's pretty um, scary. And so it turns out that we're 11 miles from that Superfund site. And I looked you all up, you're six miles from that Superfund site, it has dioxin. And dioxin is one of the chemicals that's part of Agent Orange, which was sprayed as an exfoliant. It's an herbicide, uh, was used in Vietnam to clear a lot of the trees away. And Agent Orange wasn't called Agent Orange because it's orange or turns your eyeballs orange or makes you poop orange or something like that. It's actually orange because of the orange barrels that it was, uh, it was stored in. And so when we think about, you know, where can you get your exposure, we now know in Parkinson, if you have grown up on a farm or you have well water and you get close to these industrial sources of, of uh, pollutants, this raises your risk of later getting Parkinson disease. The other one that's shockingly high as an example is called trichloroethylene or TCE. It's used as a degreaser, it's used in dry cleaning, it's used in industry, and it's been known for years. And this is a, a, a letter that appeared from Carrie McCord in 1932 in, in JAMA, which is the Journal of the American Medical Association, talking about toxicity of TCE and talking about the, the frequent failure to disclose the toxic nature and practical dangers of its use. Does it sound familiar to you? Again, you know, we're not telling the public about this, but the odds ratios with significant TCE exposure are extremely high, five, eight, you know, very high. One, it would be a, a push, a bet that doesn't show anything. And so some of these things like paraquat and TCE have very high odds of putting you at risk for the later occurrence of Parkinson. And so my summary is, is, is that the environment, pesticides we didn't pay attention to, chemicals we didn't pay attention to for the last 20 years. But as science has evolved and we've seen replication of findings, we become worried. Yesterday, there was a publication out in JAMA Neurology showing that the risk of exposure to Agent Orange also doubles your risk for dementia. And so these things have consequences. Now, if you wanna remember this talk a little bit, let me just show you the two barrels I showed you on purpose here, orange and blue, those are the gator colors. Okay, so let's talk about A for advocacy. So prevent, advocate, care, develop treatments. That's the pact, right? That's the path that we need to take. And so we have to ask ourselves, what did we learn from other efforts? And when we researched for the book, we looked very specifically at polio and at HIV. And there are a lot of things to learn. And the first example comes from Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the comedian Eddie Cantor, who took up his cause and they were the first to understand the importance of advocacy for a cause. You can see that these are the dimes that were mailed into the White House. This over 
overcame the ability of the White House mailroom to handle the number of dimes. I think I was looking yesterday, you know, two million. And in fact, uh, we talked about a dime campaign yesterday uh, with, uh, with our grassroots groups in Parkinson, but the White House has now uh, banned sending any money you know, to, uh, to them so that they don't become overwhelmed again. And of course, they don't want to handle money. But this effort led to Franklin Delano Roosevelt founding the Infantile Paralysis Foundation and was a great example of how advocacy led to resources, which led to public support, which led to research and to ultimately to the polio vaccination, which had such an important impact on American history. Human immunodeficiency virus is probably the best, uh, most recent example of this. This is a picture of advocates for HIV placing a gigantic condom over Jesse Helms, a lawmaker from South Carolina's house. And it says a condom to stop unsafe politics. Helms is deadlier than a virus. And they were charismatic. Uh, they were bold. They um, peacefully um, seized control of the FDA and, and sat in at the FDA. They created quilts. Uh, connecting quilts on the mall, and they brought their voices forward with incredible advocacy efforts that changed the trajectory of HIV from when I was an intern, where it was more of a ward style, you know, if you got HIV and AIDS, it was not a chronic livable condition. Uh, it was, you know, one of those things that people considered a death sentence, and we didn't know how to deal with it. And this advocacy effort is what drove the change. So how would I grade our response in Parkinson's? Well, I don't wanna to be too public about this because I've worked in advocacy since 2006 with the Parkinson's Foundation in addition to running a lab and doing research in this area, but we've had a lot of great people that we've worked with. I think we've done a great job, but I don't think we should pat ourselves on the back too much. And I think we can call overall the effort and what we've yielded as disappointing because the disease continues to grow unchecked and we haven't reached that inflection point where we have made uh, the true impact that we're hoping for. So let's talk about the C. We talked about P is prevent, A is advocate, C is care. We have to develop care for the folks that have Parkinson. Remember I showed you the millions of people that have it and the millions more who will get it. And so we recently came out with this book that was stuck in the warehouses in Canada because of the pandemic. It's called Living with Parkinson's Disease. And it was stuck because they printed it and everything closed down and they couldn't actually get it out until late summer and early fall. But it's out there now. And we chose a publisher called Robert Rose. And if you go to your kitchens and you look at your cookbooks and the bottom part of your cookbook, you'll see a lot of the famous cookbooks are done by Robert Rose Publishing. And the reason we chose them is because they have great ways of distilling information for people into boxes and charts and things. And so it was a really great um, partnership. And we believe now that we should be taking a larger look at Parkinson when we think of care. And remember, I told you that one of the great tragedies in Parkinson is, is that people receive the diagnosis and they think it's like Alzheimer's or a brain tumor and they don't think it's livable. And part of this is, is because the image goes back to this 1886 sketch by a famous neuroscientist named William Gowers who practiced medicine. And it sort of has this decrepit old man with Parkinson. But it turns out that Parkinson isn't one disease, it's many diseases. Remember I told you the title of the book could have been Parkinson's diseases. And you can see here in this uh, JAMA Neurology article that Melissa Armstrong and I um, recently published that you know we're showing now what we think you should replace your slides with, showing people living with it, showing the on-off responses with dopamine, showing that you can have both motor and non-motor symptoms symptoms that you don't see but can be disabling and understanding it's much more livable 
and that both men and women can get this disease even though there is a male predominance. So in the book, we try to highlight people who have Parkinson, and this is Bob Dean, and he, uh, as Ed Wilkinson probably knows, is a University of Florida uh, alumnus. He's a pathologist, and his wife had Parkinson, and he takes beautiful uh, pictures, and he took pictures for both of the books. And so on the Living of Parkinson's book, each chapter has somebody who's actually living with the disease. And so we would say it's time to end the PD man. It's not just a male dominated disease. And also to consider there are many Parkinson's features and that they're quite livable. So when we think about caring for Parkinson, we must get the diagnosis correct. Uh, we've pointed this out many times. This is a previous book we wrote for the foundation called 10 Secrets to a Happy Life with Parkinson. And it has a quote in it from the novel Pretty. You never know when you're gonna get a sign or to look next, but it's most important that you know the signs. And with my apologies to the Alzheimer's Foundation, but Parkinson's is not Alzheimer's. And we need to make sure people understand the diagnosis, understand that it's livable, and understand what the potential treatments and treatment approaches are and if you're interested, uh, Melissa and I also wrote an article for, for JAMA, for Big JAMA, just in February or March. We did a podcast, and there's a patient page for this uh, as well on the latest treatment algorithms for uh, diagnosis and treatment of Parkinson. Now, the other thing that we preach quite a bit is this idea when we care for Parkinson that folks that are living with it are always seeking like, what's the new medicine? And, you know, there's more than a dozen medicines for Parkinson, but I think this quote by Joshua Harris is really important. And he says, the right thing at the wrong time is indeed the wrong thing. He's not the only person in history that has used this quote, but Parkinson is a disease of timing. And we need to teach folks that it's the timing that's more important than the type of pills that you take to be successful. And I think many people are just caught on watching the TV commercials and looking for the latest, greatest, true cure. But if we look at timing, particularly as the disease changes, this can really change how well we care for folks. And then just to be a little bit dark, this is a quote by Jared Kitts, who says, I have a favorite cemetery I go to because it's really clean and the doctors and the nurses are all very nice. And, you know, hopefully you're giggling a little bit, but it's kind of true. And we have a 1-800-4-PD-INFO helpline at the Parkinson's Foundation. I've answered 30,000 questions on the online Ask the Doctor forum, which we just retired this past year. We still have our 1-800 line, but we now know that if you're going into the hospital with Parkinson's, the very first requirement of a hospital is that it should do the sick no harm, as Florence Nightingale said. And so we've developed these free kits. You can call our helpline to get them. So you're prepared if you have Parkinson when you go in the hospital and you can give information to your doctors and nurses and care team and advocate for yourself. So you don't end up where Jared Kintz says you might end up and you're not worse off for going into the hospital, which is what happens to most folks with Parkinson. We also have had a coming to aha moment about exercise and rehabilitation. And we now realize that exercise is super important. And we know that bad therapy for Parkinson is actually worse than no therapy. So it's important that you get the right regimen. We've learned lots of tips, lots of easy tips. Like if you cough when you're eating, that should prompt you to get an evaluation because you might be um, putting it down the wrong tube down into your lungs and not even know it. And so we check for this regularly now in Parkinson because it's one of the things we can prevent. And we've also learned that bursts of therapy are not ideal. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you have a stroke and you have physical therapy, you go for six or eight weeks and then they discharge you. If you have Parkinson's, you should be doing exercise and therapy throughout the course of every week and throughout the course of every year. And we're now learning this and beginning to understand how to uh, apply this. And one of our 
young, um, outstanding doctors has a grant uh, to do this, Dr. Al, right next door to you, looking at this called burst therapy versus, um, versus uh, regular intermittent therapy in Parkinson. And so we need to work on this because we also need to change the payer system to make sure that the payers are now gonna pay the Parkinson folks to have the right rehabilitation. There's also been a fear, a fear that's probably been stoked by industry and all these new drugs. And Francis Sissisi said, start by doing what's necessary, then do what's possible, and suddenly you're doing the impossible. But many people with Parkinson's start this way, but then start to read on the internet about how dopamine and other therapies are bad, and then they start to avoid them, and they start to only take these new therapies that are out there. And the reality is, is that we have the data now that shows you're not going to get an Olympic medal for delaying therapy. And that if you have symptoms that are affecting your quality of life, you definitely should start um, medications and they're not going to cause bad effects down the road. And we have to do a better job of teaching people that so that we're caring. Remember C is for the caring. So we're having these very clear caring things that we can do for folks. And one thing to keep your eye on for the next five years will be nutrition and the microbiome. Malu Tanzi next door has a Parkinson Foundation Center of Research Excellence, one of only a few in the country, looking at the connections between the gut and the brain. And I love this quote, if you don't take care of your body, where are you gonna live? And there are tips with nutrition to help uh, people with Parkinson's. There's some data to suggest a Mediterranean diet may be better. We're still in the early days. We don't know really about uh, how the microbiome could uh, affect both the symptomatic treatment of Parkinson and maybe other aspects of the Parkinson. And so it's early days, but I think you're going to see a slew of studies uh, in this area. It's really quite interesting. And finally, the neuropsychiatric symptoms. So these are the behavioral symptoms. And we forget that depression is the largest unmet hurdle for Parkinson, and it is treatable. And we keep making the same mistake over and over, which is we see the depression, we give a medicine because we're drug dealers, we give them a medicine, and we say, we'll see you in six months. That's not the way to treat depression. We need to be seeing people back in a week or two, monitoring them, making sure they're safe, getting them to the right dose, instead of just giving them a medicine and praying either they don't get hurt um, or they don't get better. The other issue is that we now know that one in five to one in six folks may not have depression or anxiety, but may just get demoralized. It's demoralizing to have a disease like this. And we need to recognize this because it's so common and help people to be able to reclaim their lives and have a reason for living. Because remember I told you there are lots of good treatments for the disease. And so these are unmet hurdles that we need to think about if we're going to better treat the disease. And finally, the area for the T is the development of new treatments. And there are lots of people that are waiting for these treatments. And I think of the man standing on top of the globe looking at his watch. You know, people are waiting. They really would like to see something happen soon. And we know that we're underfunded. And when we think about this, think about it in these simple terms. HIV receives three billion, that's B, billion dollars a year from the National Institutes of Health, which is the largest funder of research in the world. This funding has prevented thousands, if not millions, from ever developing HIV and stemmed from that large advocacy effort and using this idea of the pact. Parkinson's gets $200 million a year. HIV, three billion. Parkinson's, 200 million. And so this is the point that we made in the Daily Beast op-ed was that we need to speed up. And part of speeding up is first doubling that 200 to 400 and then doubling from 400 to 800. We've got to get up to the level where we're gonna double down and increase the amount of research that's going into Parkinson by a factor of 10, at least from the financial aspect. And why should we fund? Well. It turns out that these little yellow pills, some of you may have seen them before, these dopamine replacement pills remain the best treatment. However, it's over 50 years old. And although we have DBS and some other treatments, none of these stop the disease progression. And so what's on the horizon? Well, 
you're going to see more therapies that are precision medicine. So about 15 or 20 percent of people have gene defects with Parkinson, 80 percent don't. That may be where the environment is playing a role. So common genes are like the LRRK2 gene and the GBA gene. And we're going to begin to target these specific genes and pathways. We're developing new devices for deep brain stimulation and neuromodulation. That's what our laboratory does. There are drugs. We talked about things on TV like Humira and other TNF-alpha drugs. There's, that's just one example of many that may change disease course. We need to understand that. And we need to understand compounds that may even be FDA approved already that could actually slow disease progression. And so we've looked at blood pressure medicines like esratapine and gout lowering medicines like inazine and diabetes medicines like pioglitazone and even malarial medicines, which was the reason that many of us laughed that had done clinical trials because malaria medicines often come up as positive. So we didn't have, frankly, much confidence that hydroxychloroquine was going to be a viable treatment, especially with the toxicity. But Franklin Roosevelt talked about doing the best that we can and modifying as we go along. And if we can modify Parkinson, you know, to make it extend for 10 or 15 more years, then people will actually expire of other things and that will be a great change for the field. We do this type of work in our laboratory where we've taken the signals that come out of the brain and we develop these pacemaker-like devices to respond in real time. And now we've seen commercialization of much of that technology. And then finally, you have to think about the neuroimmunological system, how the neuroimmune system is working and think about the inflammation that's going on in the brain and other areas. And William Foge said that vaccines are the tugboat of preventative health, and there are several vaccines in development. We have one at UF, there are many that are actually already in human clinical trials, and they may clear that bad protein from the brains of folks with Parkinson, but we have no idea whether that will result in a symptomatic benefit, whether there'll be adverse events, associated with it, whether it would be safe. And we have no idea whether it could change disease progression, but this idea of stemming neuroinflammation and working on the neuroimmune system is something that you're going to see in the next five to 10 years. And the last thing we must do for Parkinson research is develop a biomarker. And people throw this term out a lot, and I'm just going to tell you why I think it's important. The reason it's important for a disease like Parkinson's is that if you have no way to measure, you know, when you give a drug or a device or a therapy, if you have no way to measure whether your intervention has actually changed the biology of the disease, then you're just guessing. You don't know if you change disease progression. You don't know if you change symptomatically. You need a way to measure progression over time. And in order to run these studies, we've needed thousands and thousands of folks with Parkinson. It takes a long time to do that. But if you develop a biomarker, here's one proposed biomarker from David Valancourt uh, at the University of Florida. This is called free water imaging. If we can measure the little black areas uh, where the, the dopamine cells die in Parkinson and measure that progression over time, we can reduce the number of folks we need in clinical trials to test all of these therapies from thousands to hundreds. And therefore, we can catalyze the process of moving um, treatments, meaningful treatments faster. And so David and I have a large grant from the National Institutes of Health that we believe has been funded to do this with 21 centers um, throughout the United States using Parkinson study group centers and uh, Parkinson Foundation uh, centers. And I think the development of the ability to be able to track disease progression could be a game changer because it'll change the number of people we need um, to enroll in studies to make those changes. So thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, these are the new books that are out there. You can get them on Amazon if you're interested. All the proceeds go to charity. And uh, so we're happy to get reviews on Amazon as well. And there is a group called the PD Avengers, and that's a group, a grassroots group that started after we published the book, uh, Prescription for Action and Ending Parkinson's Disease. And we now have several thousand members. And I think it's gonna take that type of effort, advocacy effort to try to double down and do what we've done for polio and for HIV and for COVID-19 
for Parkinson. But feel free to reach out to us on Twitter or blog spots or email us and we'll, we'll send some copies of the books over to your library. And with that, this is my contact information, Oaken at neurology.ufl.edu. And again, I just want to acknowledge the NIH, Tyler Shout for Dystonia Cure, the Tourette Association, and Parkinson Foundation, who are the main funders of my own personal research. So I have time for questions if you all uh, have any. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Ed, I do have some questions in chat, but if you want to lead us off. Well, thank you very much, uh, Michael. Uh, very important disease entity, and I think everyone here has learned quite a bit. I'm interested in the question about uh, drugs of abuse causing uh, or being related to Parkinson's, and I just think about the facts that some people have had this experience with designer drugs damaging the substantia nigra. Yeah, so it's a, a, a great question. Um, the, the index case of that was a man named George Carrillo. And George Carrillo um, lived in uh, California and took a designer drug. And what happened was is um, he was trying to make, um, you know, a, a chemical MPP plus, which is kind of like an ecstasy like chemical and you know, you make one little change here or there and it looks a little more like MPTP, which is a drug that causes Parkinson. We didn't know it at the time, Ed, and, and it's really uh, a fascinating history. There's actually, Bill Langston was the one that uncovered this. He's a, a scientist and neurologist in California and did the detective work to track this down. And he has a book um, that was written and there's a PBS documentary called The Frozen Addict, you know, so I know you all are sitting, uh, you know, like looking for these things. So watch The Frozen Addict is a great, great one to watch. And it's the George Carrillo story. And what's really interesting is that this recreational drug actually led to the revolution in Parkinson research, because even when I was a fellow at Emory, we would inject the MPTP into monkeys, you know, on one side into their carotids to do experiments so we could make them Parkinsonian. So we actually used the chemical from this discovery from recreational drug use. This accidental chemical became the chemical that drove Parkinson research for the next 30 or 40 years uh, forward. Now, if you look at odds ratios, so remember we talked about the bet. So the bets in Las Vegas on, on whether you're going to develop Parkinson's disease, they, they roll into something called the odds ratio. And basically, if you have an odds ratio of one, that's, that's like a push in Las Vegas. Nobody wins the bet. The house and you don't win the bet. If your odds ratio is less than one, then what you're studying is actually protective. You know, so maybe coffee is protective or ibuprofen is somewhat protective of getting Parkinson. Um, smoking is protective of getting Parkinson, by the way. Don't anybody go smoke because of that. But if your odds ratio is more than one, then, then you have a higher risk of getting Parkinson. And the odds ratios are really high for people who have abused drugs and, um, and cocaine and amphetamines and everything. So you're absolutely right. That's another risk factor for coming down with Parkinson. Does that answer your question? Yes, excellent. Michael J. Fox, by the way, when he was filming Doc Hollywood and McAnopy was doing drugs at the time and uh, he was doing cocaine and uh, with Woody Harrelson in the top floor of the um, University Center Hotel, which sits where now the new cancer hospital is. And he probably sped his uh, unmasking of Parkinson because he had a genetic form of Parkinson's disease to get it that early. But you can also, the drugs are probably unmasked something that might be there in your genetics as well, just like the environment can unmask it. So it's a little more complicated um, you know, when, you, when you look at it. But there are folks that don't have genetic abnormalities that increase their risk of getting Parkinson's disease. Well, we have several questions. Uh, Ken Burns. Thank you, Ed. And thank you, Michael. I thought that was an outstanding uh, talk. The presentation uh, really shows somebody who's had a lot of experience with, uh, presenting the issue. 
uh, to the public. And I, I think that's what we're really looking for in uh, this kind of series. Uh, I have a couple of very brief comments. <laughs> the first is semi-critical. The picture you showed with FDR, he's sitting there with Basil O'Connor, who was the president of the March of Dimes. Uh, I don't know what you said about Eddie Cantor, I'm sure is absolutely correct. Uh, secondly, um, I remember when Saul Schneider uh, discovered that that recreational drug, but, but how it was uh, causing symptoms of TB. Um, and he presented that many years ago. But uh, the reason I bring that up is that one of our offspring, Jude Samulski from here, who's a noted gene therapist, uh, very early on, uh, treated some monkeys with that recreational drug. And uh, then he used gene therapy to put in uh, tyrosine hydroxylase. Uh, and the, the, the results were astounding. The trouble was that the university wouldn't let him show the video demonstrating the results because that what had happened with the monkeys before they got treated, uh, they thought was too horrible. And, be very upsetting uh, to the public. So I, my question is, uh, do, do, what's going on with uh, gene therapy at the moment that you know about? Yeah, so um, just first, thanks for pointing that out. I, actually, if you look on the internet too, I was just Googling it, it calls it, it I don't, I didn't, you know, obviously I don't know Eddie Cantor myself, but it does credit that as him. So. We're going to have to change that. We have a paperback version. So I'm glad you mentioned it so we can change the caption. So, you know, nobody has caught that. So, so good catch. Um, in terms of gene therapy and Parkinson's disease, um, it's actually quite successful in, um, in animals, you know, at this point. And there's been a couple of attempts at it, the AADC, amino acid decarboxylase, tyrosine hydroxylase deficiency in children with, with straight TH deficiency that develop Parkinson's disease. It works really well. And I'm a handling editor at JAMA and I just saw the uh, long-term follow-up papers coming through on, you know, the children that got that as well. And, um, and so it works. One of the issues has been um, as we've given it and, and several companies have spun off neurologics was the most recent company that spun off and, and it didn't, it didn't go anywhere is because um, deep brain stimulation has been so effective. It set a bar that is too high for the gene therapies to reach. And the gene therapies haven't been as well at suppressing hyperkinetic movements like dyskinesias as modulating the circuit with electricity. So I think there, I think it's still got a ways to go, you know, to work out some of the little issues. And then the other was how it grew when it went into the implants, where it grew, and it, it's had some, you know, not to make it too complicated, but it, it's had some interfaces with serotonin that were unintended and caused people to get actually all sorts of extra movements, more than 50%, and some of the, in two of the initial studies that kind of stopped that therapy. So the most interesting gene therapy paper I can send you was where they changed the subthalamic nucleus from a glutamatergic excitatory nucleus to a GABAergic by injecting the gene in and doing that. And that was um, in science, it was a really fascinating experiment. It actually worked. It just didn't have the efficacy of deep brain stimulation, but the experiment actually worked. So it's pretty interesting. Thanks, Ken. Thank, thank okay. you. If you look up. The next question is Madeline Mitchell. Madeline? Um, I have a comment, really. My dad died of, of Parkinson's, at least. He was diagnosed by two doctors as having it and two doctors as not having it. And he worked all his life in agriculture in Jamaica and uh, dealt with a lot of pesticides. So the, I'm not sure of the exact ones that he had um, or was uh, uh, exposed to. Um, but he staved off his um, Parkinson's 
for 15 years by riding a stationary bike. And um, we were very happy with that. My question is, what are the chances hereditarily that I will develop Parkinson's? Yeah, great, great question. Um, first of all, the, the, the idea of exercise um, in our most recent paper for JAMA, and then we have one coming out in the Lancet in the next couple of months, uh, Boston Bloom and myself and Christine Klein from Lübeck, Germany, uh, bosses from the Nyman gym. And, uh, you know, exercise has moved into the top tier therapy, the number, you know, like it's right up there with medicines, like you should start and you should start exercising. There's a definite symptomatic benefit from exercise. There's, we don't have the enough data yet on the neuroprotective benefit, but there's a definite symptomatic benefit. And for people with mild Parkinsonisms, um, remember I told you it's not one disease. So 10 to 15% are gene defects. For, for, for many people with mild Parkinson's, exercise could be a tremendous, uh, tremendous therapy. And so this idea that some folks like your, your father was able to ride a bike you know, we used to think, you know, these were one-offs, but there, there's actually something to this uh, that we need to, to better understand. So it's, it's humbling. You have a higher risk uh, because you have one, you have a first degree relative who had Parkinson. Was there a risk in the, um, in the family otherwise? Anybody else have Parkinson? No. Okay, so what we found is that if you look carefully, the, the, the folks who have high pesticide and high chemical exposures um, usually don't have a, a large family history associated with that. And in those cases, those tend to be more sporadic, you know, so they end up being just in that person and doesn't impart as much risk to the next generation. You have a slightly increased risk, you know, generation to, to generation, but it's not that high. So the other thing that some people will do is, uh, is get a 23andMe genetic profile or another profile and see if you carry one of the common Parkinson diseases. Remember I told you that Michael J. Fox took cocaine, right? But he also has a PDG, you know, Parkin, probably Parkin. I don't know if he's made it public, but the, the young people that have Parkinson usually have a gene. So knowing whether or not there was a gene or not in the family also decreases your risk if you don't carry it. But you may also carry the gene and not get the disease. So many people don't even want to get tested. So the, the bottom line is um, you have a slightly increased risk just from the first degree, but everything you've told me sounds pretty good. I wouldn't worry about it. Thank you. Uh, would, would you have time for a few more questions? Or almost sure. A, okay. Yeah, sure. Lynn Holt. Lynn? Thank you very much for your talk. My mother had this disease, so um, I'm very interested in what you had to say. Um, I had a question about the association of Parkinson's disease with Lewy body dementia. Could you comment on that? Sure. So uh, Lewy from Lewy body dementia, you may or may not know, Frederick Lewy was the one that looked under the microscope and saw these proteins that deposited in the brains of folks with Parkinson's disease. And he got his name attached to it, which often happens. It becomes, you know, an eponym or eponymous uh, for for Louis, uh, but it turns out if you look under the microscope for Parkinson disease and for Lewy body disease, they have essentially the same pathology. And we now know that those little Lewy bodies have a protein in them called synuclein that's abnormal. You see that in both Lewy bodies and in Parkinson. The main difference is clinically how they present. Lewy bodies within the first few years after diagnosis, you get confusion, hallucinations, cognitive symptoms, whereas those are more later things that you see in 30 or 40% of folks with Parkinson's disease. And so it can be very tricky. And 20% of the time, two zero percent of the time, neurologists are wrong on the diagnosis until they go to pathologists like Ed Wilkinson to correct us on it. So, um, so the difference is, how it presents, the pathology is very similar, and there's a raging debate uh, between experts in the field whether they're the same or actually different. All right, thank you, Michael. We have some questions. One more question on hand, and then we have some chat questions. So I'm going to go to Elliot Simon. Elliot? Uh, unmute yourself, Elliot. Uh, 
uh, doctor, you discussed um, the relationship of hard drugs such as cocaine. Have there been any studies on the use of marijuana, both medicinal and recreational, and whether that leads to Parkinson's? No studies showing a link between either THC uh, cannabis or cannabinoids without THC as causing Parkinson. Multiple studies out there showing that, um, that, that there are signals that it may be effective for anxiety, pain, and sleep in Parkinson's folks. It's used quite a bit. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's now uh, beginning to get its, its first you know, hard look you know, from, a, from a, uh, a clinical trial standpoint, so it's too early to tell. But, uh, but it does have powerful anti-anxiolytic and sleep effects and pain effects, uh, at least in my practice. And, and so even the most conservative among us that were part of the war on drugs are willing to take these medications for their Parkinson, but not causing Parkinson, no. Okay. Good. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks, Michael. Here's some questions in the chat. Uh, uh, Bella Cernan has, the, what is the per capita rate of Parkinson's rate increase? Is that a per capita, is there a per capita fixed number? And is it uh, related to the boomer cohort? Right, so um, there, there is some relationship to the boomer cohort and I'll have to swing back and ask Ray what the per capita rate is. Um, I don't have that off the top of my head. Okay, and then there's another question about, is there a lifetime behavior choices that correlate with Parkinson's disease? You probably can, you've looked into that, I suspect. Yeah, so, um, so you know, farming, well water, certain occupations with, particularly those with exposures to certain chemicals, and pesticides, um, you know, have all been shown environment, you know, mostly manganese miners, um, manganese toxicity welders as well. All right. Uh, you have uh, answered this question in part, but you may want to say more. Here's a question regarding, uh, is there a heritable and genetic version of Parkinson's disease? Yep, 15 to 20% have single DNA gene changes associated with it. Um, we have one of the world's leading neurogeneticists, Matt Ferrer here now that just joined from British Columbia. And, um, and that means that 80% do not. The two most common are LRRK2 mutations that are common in Berber Arabs and Ashkenazi Jews and, uh, and GBA mutations. Those are the two most common. Well, I think you've answered all our questions, Michael. We really sincerely appreciate you coming here today and we wish you and your research group every success. Uh, Thank you. We will, uh, we will correct the Eddie Cantor thing in the next edition, Ken, and thank you. And, uh, and I will get, uh, Ed, I'll send you the answer to the per capita question because I don't want to misspeak. <laughs>